you can see the agenda. I'm just going to do three main areas. I'm going to have a look, look at some of our numbers um, just to quantify IP uh, inventory versus linear TV inventory. I'm going to talk a little bit about what programmatic and programmatic TV means to us and then focus on the regulations and compliance piece. Um, for those of you who don't know what free will, who free will are and what we do, Sorry for the white, that, was, that didn't look like that. But what we do is we are a specialist video ad server and we're built for broadcast. We've been around for about nine and a bit years and we were acquired by Comcast 18 months ago and run as a separate company. We run solutions for broadcast inventory delivered via IP. Um, we have three business units, technology services, which is our platform, we have advisory service, and we have a, a marketplace service as well. One key thing to call out there is the marketplace sits on top of the tech platform. It's not a separate entity. Um, and that's the ecosystem that we inhabit every day. You can see up there some of our publicly named broadcast and uh, digital clients, plus some of the partners that we work with within that ecosystem all the time. OK, so intro's done. So premium video by numbers. We release a quarterly uh, monetization report. And I'm just going to run through some of the stats from Q2. Q3 is not out till. Um, next month, but they're pretty broadly the same, just the actual numbers slightly change depending on quarter. Before I do that, I have to talk about premium content, what it actually is. Um, we've just taken the definition, we worked the definition of broadcast and linear TV. Our, our, our business was built for linear television and just the movement of that content to be delivered via IP, so professionally produced, rights managed, supply limited, direct and or guaranteed inventory sold. All right, let's have a look at the actual numbers. And the numbers are really, really strong. You probably all know this, okay? But this is just to quantify what we see from our broadcast clients uh, every quarter. We've never had a quarter for three and a half years where we didn't have higher than 20% growth in ad views. It just continues to grow quarter on quarter on quarter, regardless of seasonality. Um, one thing that is interesting is the ad views is, are growing higher than the video views, so we're starting to see the loads balance out a little bit. When you dig into what the content actually looks like, short form and mid form continue to do well. They're, they're always over 10%. Um, long form, obviously, is a huge growth area. So 26%, that's quarter on quarter, and we continue to see that growing. But live is the really big story there. Live is up 146%, and I'll come back to that a bit in a minute, because this audience in Europe may be looking at that going, really? I'm not sure I agree with that, but I'll explain why that is. Now, across screens, you probably won't be surprised to see that. Wait a minute. The colors didn't work out. 42% should be desktop. The key ones I want to pull out. <laughs> yeah, this is good. <laughs> now I have to try and actually make sure I remember the slides. Uh, the key ones I want to pull out is the 20% and the 7%. The 20% is actually set to box and the 7% is OTT. Now that's a really big difference in terms of our, where our, in, our ad inventory is flowing through across our client base. And set-top box, IP-enabled ad decisions in set-top box is a huge growth area. OTT as well, it's still coming off a small base, but it is a big growth area and we continue to see it growing. And that's really important because television is television. We don't really care about any of the bits that sit in between. All that's really changing here is the delivery method of the content to the consumer, whether that be across a phone or a desktop or into the living room. And again, I'll keep, I'll keep coming back to this across some of these slides. Now, let's see if I can remember the colors. Um, on the OTT device here, this is a bit of a messy slide, but when you look at the OTT device, 95% of the content is entertainment and sports. That's, that's a typical linear television breakdown. That's users watching their, their living room content via OTT device. It's just a different delivery mechanism. To us, that's how we view IP-delivered TV for, and work with our broadcast clients. Changing gears a little bit, authenticated uh, log logged-in users, building a database, our broadcasters are looking to have a relationship with their, first, with, with their viewers and have a, literally a conversation. Now, you can see it grew from a relatively small base of 35 to 60 in a, in a year. So that change has happened in the last 12 months. It's holding stable at 60%, but if the ad views are growing, what we're talking about is an increasing number of ads occurring behind an authenticated wall. Now, I'm not going to talk about ad blocking or ad fraud, but if you are able as a broadcaster to have 
close to a one-on-one -on -one conversation with your viewer. Um, you can start to have a conversation with them about value exchange. You can send them a message and say, stop using the ad blocker, I'm going to turn you off. And we, we know of people in the ecosystem, in the broadcast ecosystem, who do this. And because they have a relationship with a first party login, it enables them to actually tell the user that that's not acceptable. But authenticated viewing is, is only going to, is here to stay and it's going to increase. OK, so I'll come back to the live point. Once we split out our European and EU clients, you can see that live is happening in the States. We have a handful of clients who do most of the sports broadcast in the US, and they're the ones who are driving that number. It isn't really happening in Europe. That's a clear opportunity. Then if you look at long form in Europe, you can see that 89% of all of the ad views are against long form content in Europe. That's vastly different to the US. We don't have the same short form culture that they have over there. Here, people are watching broadcast content via IP, and it's long form content. So there's two immediate opportunities there. And this is why programmatic and the, techno the technology that is being applied to trading becomes important in this market. It's bringing opportunity. Now, the sharp-eyed amongst you will notice that the set-top box stats have gone. We can't always use them if we think they'll identify clients. So we've had to drop them out of here. We don't, we are working on, we have one set-top box client live in Europe, and we will have three in two months. So probably in six months' time, we will start to have the set-top box figures in here as well. But the reason I wanted to put this slide up here is the growth on OTT. Uh, admittedly, it's in the States, but it's still an important point. The, pi the pipes, the delivery methods, that's the bit that's changing. That's the bit that's important. Television is still television. So what are the key takeaways? Why did I bother showing you the data? Well, it, the, the, the scene that we're setting in terms of our data set is digital video, premium digital video, broadcast video is, continues to grow, grow substantially, very healthy, 25% plus growth rate. OTT and set the box are gonna, only going to gain more and more traction. We know this, our clients talk to us about it, and we're seeing the viewers actually make the change themselves. So now the content in the living room is starting to really be delivered via IP, and that brings change to the way the rest of the ecosystem and the ad model uh, is, is managed. And the line between the linear and digital continues to blend. So the authentication, the increasing ad loads, this is our clients looking at, at their models and saying, clearly they have to merge. We want a unified model. All right, so that's the data done. Let's talk a little bit about programmatic and what the hell that word means to us and maybe to you. Um, firstly, though, we have to look at the ad model. Wow, the colors have gone mental. That was not supposed to be orange. Um, <laughs> it, looks, it looks all right, but. Uh, all right, so yesterday's model was easy, really. You had a unified audience. All the people in the ecosystem agreed on it. And that meant you could have a, a unified currency, a single currency that everyone could trade on leading to unified transactions. That's a, re that, that, that's a model that we all agreed on. Now, I wasn't around 50 years ago when, well, I wasn't working 50 years ago when it was growing as an industry, so I don't know how difficult it was to get to that place, but we don't have it today. The audience is massively fragmented. Users have fragmented their own device consumption, so now you can measure a BlackBerry audience via an iOS audience, via an Xbox audience. It's, the audience is hugely fragmented. That leads in itself to multiple currencies. Everybody is trying to measure different things. You can go to a handful of measurement companies, some of you who may be in this room, and you'll all have slight variations on how you build your universe and measure that activity. And therefore, today we have fragmented transactions. There's no getting away from it. We can't have scale in television, IP, delivered broadcast, and we can't bring programmatic in if we cannot agree on a, on a transaction model. And, and that's why... The free will perspective is we don't believe that the audience fragmentation is going to go away. We don't think there'll be a single winner in terms of audience measurement. It, there's going to be a mixture. And that means there's going to be multiple currencies. We don't have a global foreign exchange currency. We don't see it be any different here. We've moved beyond that. People are going to transact in different ways. But we do have to get to a unified transaction. It has to get boxed back in into a place where all parties in that ecosystem can agree that we can have a trade uh, between buyer and seller. So then we skip back to programmatic. This is what free will determine as the key parts of programmatic. Automation of the workflow. That's the technology piece that we all talk about today. And we all, you know, everyone's seen Loomscape. That's effectively that. 
automation of the workflow. The data piece, increasing data usage, increasing data pools, we saw the authenticated users rise, data coming into the buy, that is a key part of the programmatic landscape, and the transaction model. There are various transaction models today. You may have multiple ones that exist in the long term, but I talked already about unifying it. What does today actually look like, though? That's, that's kind of the future state. That's our definition of what programmatic is. And I know that everybody, different companies will have their own, but I think they're broadly in the same, same place. What does it actually look like today? Well, the technology piece doesn't exist. And some of you may disagree, but I really don't think it does. Like, it takes time to build technology, and it takes a bit more time to build it right. And there is no unified tech stack that works seamlessly end-to-end -end today, and there is no broadcaster that uses a seamless end-to-end -end tech stack in IP-delivered content. There's a lot of manual workflow. That makes it complex. It's not automated, and that has to change. We have to bring, how do you schedule ads in digital alongside a, a linear schedule? How do you dynamically serve ads against a linear schedule? There's a huge amount of progress that needs to be made in this area. But the currencies are emerging, so we have to try and find a way of translating between those currencies and those measurement sets. This is happening today. Different clients and different buyers are using different currencies. Um, that means you need more analytics. Um, and we saw the growth in live in the States. Linear events are moving to IP. We ad served all of the Super Bowl ads via IP last year for our clients. We had in the Football World Cup, which actually you have to think about when that was now, we had one of, uh, two of our clients in the States who delivered all of that uh, in live on IP and ran all the ads in dynamic ad allocation. This, this, this is a reality. So these linear events are moving. That brings its own challenges. What do you do if you have pre-booked a huge amount of ads, but actually you get massive audience spike in the first week in, say, the Football World Cup, and suddenly you've sold, you know, you've delivered that campaign? but the buyer is expecting to see one per, you know, all the way through to the campaign. It, it's a challenge. That's what we're seeing today. Then you start to look at where programmatic actually has a purpose today, and this is what we believe it really looks like. Um, again, <laughs> different colors. Um, <laughs> they're all different. But desktop is where programmatic exists today. You know, there's loads of inventory there, and crucially, it's tag-friendly. And programmatic today is executed via tags. You move to mobile and you move to OTT, and the tags are a bit harder to deal with. You know, how are you going to work on iOS? You can't always use the cookie information that you wanted to or drop cookies in, in all of those environments. So that becomes a bit harder, even though there's loads of inventory there. And from a publisher side, that's inventory you want to execute programmatically. You move to set box VOD and linear TV, and frankly, it doesn't exist. I agree with John Lewis. Programmatic TV is not a reality today. How are you bringing automated workflow and data purchasing into a space that doesn't even use any of that technology? It just is not there. Um, you take set-top box VOD. Let's say you're a buyer and you demand a viewability pixel on all of your campaigns. You can't drop it on set-top box. That technology doesn't exist. So by the definitions of the buy, that is non-viewable. It doesn't stack up. It's, the industry is not, it's not there today. OK, so where does that lead us in terms of programmatic? What's a free will perspective on what we're doing today and where we're working with our clients? Well, firstly, you have to protect the value of the inventory and the data. And that's important for both the, the seller and the buyer. This is an ecosystem that historically everyone's agreed on. You knew what you were transacting. It worked for everybody. That has to be maintained. You have to maximize ROI and available inventory, otherwise you wouldn't bother doing it. Um, and equally, from a buy side, you have to be able to maximize efficiency and reduce wastage on the buy. Again, you wouldn't bother doing it. Revenue predictability. I don't know about the last, what happened in the last session, but even if I was an exchange or any form of real-time transacted company and bringing the skill set to the market, that CFO is still going to ask for what's my forecast for next quarter and the quarter after and the quarter after. I don't know how you do that in a real-time bid environment, because how the hell do you know where your demand is or what it's going to be in six, eight months? But revenue predictability is important. It's very important if you're a listed broadcaster. If your CFO is going to demand it. 
Control and compliance and screens. I'm going to talk about this in a minute and argue why I think it's the main one, uh, or the, the pressing issue. And we need to simplify everything. All right, compliance across screens. So at a basic level, this is what we have for linear TV today. Um, you have a creative approval process. It might be a situation like we have in the UK with Clearcast where they assign a code to a creative and say, this is got alcohol in, therefore it's restricted, or this is suitable kids show, whatever it is. And all markets have some form of regulatory body that inputs into that process. It works, happy days. Scheduling. I'm a publisher, I want to be able to schedule my, uh, all of my campaigns up front for maximum yield, and crucially, I need to manage frequency capping, because none of us, as just viewers, want to see the same ad after the same ad after the same ad. That is crap experience. We've known about that for a long time. Clash control, I've sold a sponsorship, I need to ensure that the rest of the ads that return in that stream do not clash with the sponsor. This is really simple stuff. When we talk about TV regulation and compliance, I'm not talking about the Ofcom regulation and compliance, I'm talking about the self-regulation that the industry has built up over 50 years that we cannot execute in programmatic today. And that we think of free will is more important today in terms of enabling programmatic TV than yield. Data management. How do I, we talked a little bit about it already, how do I have a secure data environment and a transactable data set that all parties agree on? I would argue, wow, it wasn't meant to be gray. That's really boring. I would argue that IPTV doesn't have any of that today, though. Um, we can put a clear cast code or creative identifier on a creative, but can the broadcaster retain final control over whether that creative is allocated correctly by a third-party platform. The same goes for scheduling and, and clash. How do I manage frequency at a broadcaster if the ad being returned is coming from an outside party in real time, and I want to be able to check that I haven't already delivered it? These are important. They're very, very simple. They're simple in both. If you take digital and linear, they're managed well on both sides, and they're simple things to execute. They're just very, very difficult to execute in today's environment together. Data management. We, I showed already the, the, the desktop proportion of inventory. We transact programmatic today via using cookies. That is not secure data environment. We need the cookies to do campaign management. But at the same time, as soon as you have a cookie in place, you can harvest that audience data. That's not secure for broadcast. It becomes even more obvious when you actually look at just one stream. So you have a program sponsor gap. The first ad in the break goes out to, to a programmatic source because you get a much greater yield. It goes to return hennies, no can do. Gap is going to be pretty pissed off about that, so you have to go back to dominoes. And you can see it all the way through. You can't return Microsoft. It's already been in the stream. You can't return alcohol. This is a family-related show. The point being, this is simple execution that, as an industry, we need to collectively think about if we're to realize programmatic TV. Programmatic TV. We are not going to take a set of regulation from the digital industry and impose it on linear television. It's going to be the other way around. Yes, the technology comes from the digital industry, but the regulation is going to come from linear. We think it's important that free will, we, this is what we're focused on. We're not focused on yield. We're focused on creative separation, uh, regulation and compliance. We think there has to be more conversation within the industry and within marketplaces and within the Loomscape, frankly, around how do you have a conversation piece between what's going to be delivered, what's appropriate, and what's not. Um, data protection is vastly important. So we have to find more ways to allow all parties within the ecosystem to transact on their own data but keep it secure. Data rights management is probably going to be a massive, massive issue in the next five years. OK, and then to sum up and colliding is spelt wrong, just to go with the colors. Really good deck, thanks. Um, to, so, to, but just to finish up, let's say we do manage to get to a, an agreed space where all of that stuff starts to happen, and we start to have an agreed framework and an agreed environment in which we want to transact. And programmatic TV starts to actually maybe become a reality. We can programmatically trade linear television inventory, although less linear now, and now it's delivered via RIP. What, do we, what happens next? You start to linear, sorry, mirror linear. So you have linear scheduled ads that can run across digital. 
but be reported in real time by the digital delivery mechanism. You can have dynamic ad allocation. Let's say you pre-book a schedule. The broadcaster is not going to dynamically ad allocate every single spot. It's really expensive. But that aside, what if they don't have all the ads to fill? They're not going to send a blank slate out to, to consumers. You want to pre-book some of them and then dynamically ad allocate in between. That's the linear and IP tech merging together. Ad serving. What if you see that your audience is changing whilst the show is on? Your pre-booked linear ads you want to kick out on the fly and dynamically uh, serve into that space because you can change the audience, you get a higher yield. Again, these are, these are incremental steps. You know, we're not there, we have to manage the compliance piece first, but this is what comes. And then you get to aligning linear digital set to box, one tradable pool of inventory, increased liquidity. So I would argue that we talk about yield and programmatic today, and I think we're focused on the wrong thing. I think we need to talk about how to extend regulation from linear television and have a, build a better ecosystem in the digital side of programmatic so that we can actually realize programmatic TV. And until we do that, I have to agree with John Lewis that programmatic TV doesn't exist and, and won't. Thank you.